All right, this is the Industrial Revolution wrap. And for those of you who are confused, remember, this goes along with a handout that you're supposed to be completing to make your life easier. Once the Industrial Revolution spreads outside of Great Britain, the changes and the new inventions are so different from the spinning jenny, spinning mule, and water frame that many people call it a second Industrial Revolution. First of all, Britain is alone. They're the first to industrialize, and they try to stay the only country that's industrialized. They forbid the inventions leaving the country. There's absolutely no export of any of the ideas, the plans, the inventions once they're made. And they actually make it really difficult to leave the country itself. Anybody with any kind of mechanic experience or any kind of um, invention experience or skills were not allowed to leave Britain. However, in 1807, a mechanic named William Cockerell does go to Belgium. He actually snuck out of Britain. And so it should come as no surprise that Belgium is the second place to industrialize. Short time after, Germany, France, and the United States follow. And I'd like you to think for a moment about why. Okay, why does Belgium industrialize and Germany and France and the U.S.? Okay, remember, they also had the conditions that are necessary for industrialization, those sprite conditions, the social, political, the resources, they had the people, the technology, and of course the money. Other places in the world, specifically places like Russia in Eastern Europe and Italy in Southern Europe does not industrialize, and so I could ask you that same question, why not? They don't have sprite. They might have some of the conditions, but you really need all of the conditions for industrialization. All right, what does the second industrial revolution look like? Well, in this case, urbanization, the movement of large numbers of people to cities is well underway. By the late 1800s, our cities have skyscrapers, but they also have those overcrowded neighborhoods that you were reading about, um, those slums, so to speak. Some key inventions of the so-called second industrial revolution include the telephone in 1876, electric light in 1879, the automobile in 1887, and the airplane in 1903. So certainly what we like to call planes, trains, and automobiles, very different from the original invention, the spinning jenny. This new equipment is expensive, and so companies, in order to raise money, form what we call corporations. They sell pieces of ownership in the company as stock. New products begin to use identical components, so what we call interchangeable parts, these components that could be used in place of one another. So you didn't have to build a machine from scratch every time. You could just change out one of the interchangeable parts. And then we also start to see a method of production called the assembly line, where basically a complex job was broken down into a series of smaller tasks. Ultimately, by the late 1800s, we also start to have some reform. Laissez-faire is no longer the dominant thinking, and the government does get involved by putting some restrictions on how many hours a day a person can work and also how old somebody had to be. Um, a lot of this was the result of labor unions, workers kind of organizing themselves. Unions were legal in 1867. Um, Ultimately, by the late 1800s, most people are gaining the right to vote. I should say most men, anyway. And we slowly but surely outlaw child labor, starting with kids who are under 10. Okay, it used to be that if you were older than 10, you had to go to work, but younger than 10, um, you were off the hook. And this is when public education gets started as well. And then lastly, it's really not until the early 1900s that we do have laws that limit the workday, and we start to see the eight-hour workday becoming the norm.